Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our series um, Beyond the Numbers. This is the webinar number four. It is understanding and interpreting your cholesterol blood test. Today we have with us Dr. Joseph DeVoe, and I am Andrea Baer, the Executive Director for Mendix Heart. And I am going to go through just a couple of housekeeping notes prior to our start. Um, all attendees are in listen-only mode, which means you are all muted by the system. Um, if you cannot hear, we get this a lot, check the audio button on your personal computer to make sure the sound is on, because that's a lot of sometimes the problem. Um, and then if you want to type a question, please feel free. We actually want you to type questions. Type them into the chat box during the presentation. You don't have to wait. Um, and then the moderator, which is me, will read your questions during the question and answer period. Um, the PDF version of the slides, as well as a recording of this presentation, will be available on the Mended Hearts website following our event. So first, I'd like to introduce the organizations who have been collaborating together to bring you this series. We have Mended Hearts, whose mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life of heart patients and their families through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support, education, and advocacy. The National Lipid Association, or NLA, their mission is to enhance the practice of lipid management in clinical medicine. And the foundation of the NLA, whose mission is to improve the welfare of patients and families affected by cholesterol and triglyceride problems. As I had said earlier, I do have Dr. DeBow with us today. He's a clinical assistant professor at the University of Arizona. And before I turn that over, this over to him, I would like to launch a poll. This is a very quick poll, just to test your knowledge. Um, there's to see what you know about when you should be monitoring your lipids. So the poll should be open. It should be on your screen. If you could answer the questions, um, which one do you think is right? And at the end, we will test you again to see if you learned anything during the webinar. So we will leave just a moment to leave that open. All right. Votes are all coming in quickly. Everybody's on the ball today. All right, we have got almost one minute in. We are about 85% of you have voted. So hurry up, I'm gonna close the poll in three seconds. Okay. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. DeBow, and thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank Mended Hearts, the National Lipid Association, and the Foundation for the National Lipid Association for having me do this presentation. It's very important in, in many of our opinions for us as patients to understand what our cholesterol blood test means. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, everybody will have a good idea as to what the numbers and the acronyms mean for our cholesterol blood tests. So I have nothing to disclose as far as financial disclosures at this time. So for the presentation and understanding our cholesterol blood tests, we're gonna discuss lipids and what they are. So what are these particles that flow through our body? What is a lipid panel or the cholesterol blood test that we get from our providers? How often should you get this blood test performed, which we had that question <laughs> before we started. And also we wanna discuss how to understand and interpret this blood test. And what do these numbers mean for for people and how to adhere to a lifelong healthy lifestyle according to how your lipids are. So when we're talking about lipids and we wanna know what that means, 
Lipids are the fats that normally are found in our bloodstream. When we have normal lipid levels, they help us function properly in thinking, energy, and other essential functions. If these levels are higher than normal, they can cause significant health problems, particularly as we age over time. There are two main types of lipids in our blood. We have the cholesterol, which is a term that many of you are familiar with. There's two main types of cholesterol, which we'll talk about over the next few slides, as well as triglycerides or the fats that are in our bloodstream. I put a nice little cartoon here to lighten the mood a little bit, and that's a big uh, fat triglyceride molecule at his uh, provider's office. <laughs> So the cholesterol, the two main types, we have the LDL or the low density lipoprotein. This is typically our bad cholesterol. And I have another little sketch here with the LDL being the devil. And then we have HDL or high density lipoprotein, which is our good cholesterol. And that is depicted by the little angel here in the picture. So for LDL cholesterol, as I mentioned on the previous slide, it is typically referred to as the bad cholesterol. When the levels of LDL are too high, it can cause significant damage to your body by clogging or blocking the blood vessels as we age. The HDL is the good cholesterol. And what it does is it helps our body get rid of excess cholesterol that could otherwise collect in the walls of your blood vessels. Now, here's another cartoon to depict the difference between the two. You have the LDL here coming out of the liver that carries the bad stuff into your arteries here at the bottom. Over time, if that is an excess, we have this big plaque buildup, which could eventually lead to things like heart attack and stroke. And then the HDL here, these molecules or particles remove or help remove the LDL from the system to go back into the liver to be processed as waste. Triglycerides, this is that second part of the initial slide. The triglycerides are a type of fat in our bloodstream. They provide fuel to our body to operate properly, kind of like how our cars need gasoline. They mostly come from your diet, but we do make them in our body. When we eat, we take the triglycerides we do not need and store them in fat cells to use later as fuel. Unfortunately, too many triglycerides can cause significant health problems. So this is where our diet comes into play. So next question is how do I find out my lipid levels? Well, your healthcare provider will order a lipid blood panel and that will measure the levels of these lipids in your bloodstream. And this panel is typically ordered in adults over the age of 20 years, at least once every five years. Now, your healthcare provider, they could recommend the panel be performed if you are at heightened risk for things like heart disease, stroke, or other complications. So what does this blood panel consist of? So it measures all of the lipid particles in our bloodstream or the standard measurements. Now, there's some very advanced testing that we could touch on slightly at the very end, but the typical standard panel that you would normally get, let's say your annual physical, or um, if you see a cardiologist or an endocrinologist for diabetes, for instance, they may order this typical panel once a year. And the panel consists of the total cholesterol, your triglycerides, your LDL, your HDL, the non-HDL, VLDL and the cholesterol HDL ratio. And we're gonna talk about each one of these as we go forward. Now, I put a standard picture from Quest Laboratories of what the routine lipid panel looks like. And I will confess, this is actually my lipid panel. <laughs> um, and I do need a lot of help to have it look this good and I, it's still not, the greatest, but we're gonna use my panel as reference as we go forward to explain each one of these values. So what do all these numbers mean? And I had to put the confused, frightened cat because this is 
intense terminology at times. And I, and I think sometimes us as providers, we do tend to forget how to explain it to patients appropriately at times. So hopefully we'll get out of this webinar the explanation and the details of what each of these mean and help, hopefully it'll help you better understand in the end once you get your next lipid profile drawn. So the total cholesterol or TC, it measures your good plus bad cholesterol. So it's an equation or a combination. High levels of total cholesterol can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. These levels can be falsely elevated when your good HDL cholesterol is very high. The standard of care has always been, we recommend it being under 200 milligrams per deciliter. Now, there are situations where it is much higher, like I spoke of with the good cholesterol being high. So nowadays we, we focus our treatment on targeting some of the other separate lipids in this particular blood panel. So here we go, on my blood work, we have total cholesterol at the top, or just cholesterol on some of the, the panels as, as depicted here. My results were 128 milligrams per deciliter, so that's very good, and it's definitely below the 200 level that we spoke about on the previous slide. Now the triglycerides, we come back to these fat molecules again. These are best to be measured when you're fasting. So this is typically drawn in the early morning after a good night's rest without eating because triglycerides primarily come from our diet and we can get false elevation if we end up eating prior to the blood test. Now, the, a high level of triglyceride is typically greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter. And if it is, it can increase, increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. But there are situations where patients have very high levels of triglycerides from certain situations like genetic issues or diabetes, things of that nature, greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter can increase your risk of pancreatitis or irritation of the pancreas and other health problems. Pancreatitis is definitely something that you do not want because it is very painful and it takes a while to get better from. In some cases, permanent damage can be caused to the pancreas. So here on the, the panel, the triglyceride level is 96 milligrams per deciliter, which is under the 150 standard. So we're in good shape there. Now for the cholesterol to HDL ratio, this is still interpreted on standard lipid panels and it is divided, the, it, you find the value by dividing the total cholesterol by your HDL. The ratio is shown on the panels, like I said, but we're not quite sure what the usefulness is. The use of the actual ratio in evaluating health risks is not recommended at this time by the National Lipid Association and other groups, and it should not influence the healthcare decisions or treatment decisions for each patient. And the value here on mine is 3.7, which is less than the 4.9 range. Now, the HDL cholesterol, the good guys. Higher levels are usually associated with lower risk of cardiac disease or cardiovascular disease. Normal or high levels might be less effective in lowering your risk if LDL and the non-HDL particles are significantly elevated. This particularly goes for patients in higher, very high risk categories with um, coronary artery disease in their heart where they're there's blockages in their heart or their arteries in their legs or the carotid arteries. HDL levels can lower in your body if you smoke, have an extremely low fat diet or have high levels of triglycerides. HDL levels should ideally be greater than 40 milligrams per deciliter. Now my HDL here is 35 and this is not very good. <laughs> no matter what I do, I cannot increase my HDL. And that is an issue with genetics for me in particular. So I have work to do, but I'm not quite sure if I'll ever be able to get it at least to 40. Now VLDL or very low density lipoprotein 
is another bad guy. It's one of the LDLs, and it is created in your liver to carry triglycerides throughout our body. Now, the main difference between the very low density lipoprotein and your LDL is that they have different percentages of cholesterol, proteins, and triglycerides that make up each particle. The very low density lipoproteins contain more triglycerides, where the LDL itself contains more cholesterol particles. Now, elevated levels of the very low density lipoprotein can significantly increase heart disease and stroke. The ideal level in your blood should be less than 29 milligrams per deciliter. Now, mine here on this panel is 19 milligrams per deciliter, so I'm in pretty good shape here, which is very good. Now, the LDL, the worst guy. This is, this is the lipid particle that we target most of the time when we start to set up our treatment plans. Now, as lipidologists, we do a lot of other things with many of the other particles, but treating cholesterol at the primary care level, a lot of times LDL is the main target. So with this, the optimal level of LDL depends on the risk factors and your healthcare provider will determine those risk factors. Patients that are at higher risk are people who have previous strokes, heart attacks, diabetes, smoking, aging, and family history. Now aging we can't help or family history we can't control, but the other things we can. So each of these patients require a lower goal of LDL in the bloodstream. Um, and the risk factors determine the normal goal level. So somebody who is high risk or standard risk per se, we like to say in lipidology, is an LDL goal of less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now patients with very known disease, such as heart attack strokes, stents in the heart or the carotid arteries or stents in your legs, we like them to have an LDL level of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter as studies show the outcomes are much better at that level. And as you can see here, mine is at 74 milligrams per deciliter. Now I don't have a history of any kind of stenting, strokes or heart attacks, thankfully. I could do a little bit better here and uh, that's something I do need to work on, but 74 is a very good spot if you're a healthy individual. Now the non-HDL or the non-high density lipoprotein, so basically these are all the particles that aren't the good ones in combination. So this is a number that is calculated to provide a useful measure of all the bad stuff in your bloodstream. How we figure that out is we subtract the good HDL from the total cholesterol. Then the calculated non-HDL has been shown to more accurately predict the risk of developing future cardiovascular disease, which is heart attack or stroke. Ideally, we want this level to be less than 30 milligrams per deciliter above your LDL goal. So for an example, I put a little line here. If your LDL goal is at 100, like we talked about on the slide previously, then your non-HDL goal would be 130 milligrams per deciliter or less. And as you can see here, the non-HDL in my panel is 93 milligrams per deciliter, so we're also in pretty good shape there. So some final thoughts here on the lipid blood panel. What we talked about today was basically just the overview of all of the standard measurements that we see in a lipid profile. This blood panel is typically drawn when you have your annual physical or any cholesterol lipid medication adjustment by your healthcare provider. There are other lipid particles and genetic studies that I sort of mentioned earlier, and we'll save those for another session, um, that you know, your healthcare provider may perform for you depending on your particular health situation and lifestyle. So here at the end, I had a, another little cartoon with the cholesterol and triglyceride fatty deposit sketches and the triglycerides are saying we're over our energy quota again what should we do with the excess and the other one says store it as fat and then then they come back to say we've been doing that kind of a lot lately shouldn't we maybe stop 
And then the other particle says, no, we need all this energy someday, possibly, or maybe. <laughs> Thank you guys for your patience and for your attention during this presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. DeBell. We appreciate that. Um, I have a list of questions. We already have some questions. As a reminder, anyone who would like to ask a question, please enter it into the chat box and um, we will start um, asking the questions. Um, so the first question is, isn't LDL cholesterol necessary for the brain? So that's an excellent question. We have patients in our lipid clinic that we have prescribed certain medications to get their LDL as low as possible. Now, there are studies that show you do need a little bit, but then there are also studies where the lower the better. Now, I do have patients that have an LDL of zero. So we are doing a lot more work as far as trying to figure out how necessary and what levels they need to be at for normal function. So far with patients that I have that are in the range of zero or less than 10 milligrams per deciliter have done very well and I've not seen any problems yet, but that's still a work in progress and that is an excellent question. Great. So the next question is, um, I'm a lifelong vegetarian who had very low cholesterol levels my entire life until menopause. But over the past eight years, my total cholesterol has gone from about 130 to 205. Um, my doctor doesn't seem concerned, but I am. Why such an increase when my diet has remained steady? So with hormonal changes, sometimes we can produce more lipid particles in our body. And we do see this in women in the menopausal bracket. And it all depends on what separate particles through the uh, lipid profile would depend on what we would treat. Now, if your triglycerides or HDL are a little bit elevated, causing the total cholesterol to bump over 200, maybe the provider's not as concerned and all combining with, you know, history, heart and cardiac and stroke type history things. If, if everything has been normal and we've only seen this bump after menopause, we typically watch it. Now, some patients we do treat and, and diet alone when we have hormonal changes sometimes doesn't help. Great. Okay, the next question is, how about SDLDL cholesterol? SDLDL cholesterol? So typically, um, that's actually a really good question because we don't, um, we only draw that at least in my practice through like a Boston heart or phosphorus labs and those small dense particles, they're more dense than your normal LDL particles. Um, but basically it describes when you look at the value, it gives the total amount of LDL C in a small dense format. So yes, if, if, if your small dense LDL is elevated, then we have to worry about treating and preventing future incidents. So it is, it's a pretty bad thing to have elevated. Great. So um, the next question is wondering if the number on your lipid panel um, is that you're on a statin or any other lipid modulating agent. Excellent question. I was hoping I would get this. Yes, I am. And the reason being is, well, actually, I will tell you why I got into cholesterol. I was born with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, or the HEFH, where my LDL particles not on any treatment were nearing 300 milligrams per deciliter, which is extremely dangerous. So, Thankfully, I only need resuvastatin 40 milligrams once a day, and it got me down into the 70s. So I'm very thankful for that. But it was a problem for several years where, you know, before we knew all the advancements we've had in, in, in lipidology and, and studying and treating cholesterol, you know, I was very scared as a younger person. And I've had calcium scores performed and 
and some other testing to make sure I didn't have any buildup because that's a pretty serious thing. So yes, to answer that question in a long way, I am on resuvastatin 40 milligrams a day. Great. So the next question is, what is the function of the pancreas? So the pancreas is one of our, if it's one of our most important organs that's kind of underrated. So it is responsible for a couple of things. One, regulating insulin. So diabetic patients, the pancreas is important for everybody, but in a sense, for patients with diabetes and we're, we're not pr we're producing too much sugar and not enough insulin, the pancreas isn't working as well as it did before. Also, the pancreas works in aiding in digestion. Now, it, if we talk about pancreatitis or what I'd mentioned when the triglycerides are severely high and they can pack up the pancreas, so to speak, it's a very serious, painful medical condition. And you have to be hospitalized for it on IV fluids and, and other treatments. So we're very um, protective of the pancreas in lipidology, considering what diabetes can do to our body and you know triglycerides affecting the pancreas. So I hope that answered it the way you wanted it answered, but it is responsible primarily regulating the insulin in our body to keep our glucose levels in check. Great. All right, so the next question is, my doctor told me that my blood test showed I should make lifestyle changes and that a statin would not work well for me. Do you know what reason that would be or what in what ways that that might happen? So there are a, a few ways to look at this and every everybody's trained in a different manner when it comes to lifestyle and treatments for your cholesterol. The, the good news there is the likelihood of diet and exercise helping reduce your cholesterol is very high. So hopefully, you know, you're close to goal and diet and exercise would work. Now, patients with genetic issues, you do need some kind of therapy. Statin's not working. I'm not quite sure about that comment, but they typically work very well. The question might be then whether or not you truly need any medical therapy and lifestyle and you know exercise and diet would actually get you to go without any medical therapy. It could have just been the way that they phrased it. Great. The next question comes, how can we increase our HDL? How can you increase your HDL? Excellent question. So I have this problem myself. So diet and exercise can help increase HDL. Some of the treatment modalities like statins and some of the other things we use can help increase it. Now, as I mentioned before, the smoking, um, bad habits like that, you know, will reduce it. And some patients like me, I can't elevate it at all. My, my HDL is a genetic, it's a part of the genetic issue and I can't get it higher than 35. I mean, I've tried so hard with eating and exercise and we just do the best we can. Some people are very lucky and they're born with higher HDL and they have good genetics and some of us aren't. So HDL is one of those, those target particles that's, that can be difficult to, to increase. Great. Um, the next question is, can you take statins to keep your cholesterol lower, like in a preventative manner? Well, you can. So it just depends on what your levels are. Now, if, if a patient comes to me and their cholesterol is normal, they're, all the particles are normal, they're in great shape, they eat well, they exercise, I probably wouldn't recommend it just to kind of keep, you know, patients from taking medications that they may not necessarily need at that time. However, statins have been shown in long-term studies to protect the vasculature and protect future events. So it's one of those things where the patient would have to work specifically with their healthcare provider to decide what's best for them. Great. Um, can you give a formula again for the non-HDL? 
So the non-HDL, the formula is, it's basically the bad particles minus the good HDL. So all those things in the panel I talked about. We could probably show that slide again, actually. Is there a way to do that? Yeah. <laughs> go back through non-HDL, right there. There we go. So you subtract the HDL from the total cholesterol particles in your body. That includes the triglyceride count. So you remove the good stuff from the whole the whole pile, so to speak. And then that's what the leftover is, and we call that the non-HDL. And as you can see down here, if your goal LDL is 100, then your non-HDL goal will be 130 or less. So that's kind of the target we use for treatment and for lifestyle. Great. Um, what is the value of measuring uh, APO B as a metric? I'm not sure. I that's another one of those advanced particles. Okay. Measuring it as a metric in advanced cholesterol is, is important because of, you know, increased levels are known to cause heart attack and stroke. So it's definitely an important thing to measure. And it would be very nice to talk about in the advanced cholesterol studies at some point. I'm kind of winking here because we could do that down the road maybe, you never know. But um, it's worth it as a metric for sure. Nowadays we're finding with the way that, that the APOs or the APOs attach to these triglyceride particles when they either come out of the intestine or the liver in our body, it, they can be detrimental if they're an overabundant. Right. Um, do you ever check LPA? And if you do, when? I check LPA on every brand new patient that I see for lipids. I also check LPA on patients who've had coronary vas or vasculature or stroke incidents that we've never checked it on in the cardiology practice. So LPA is very important now. We know it as an independent risk factor to cause heart attack and stroke. And we also know that LP little a is sometimes the hidden enemy. There are patients that genetically have it extremely elevated and their cholesterol panel that we talked about here today in this webinar is completely normal. And they end up having a heart attack when they're 50. So now the good news is insurance companies are covering this where before patients would wind up with a magical bill. So at least nowadays, it's, it's, it's very worthwhile to do, especially in the brand new patient that I, I don't particularly know yet. I always do it. Great. Um, so let me see. The next one, there's always lots of great questions, aren't there? <laughs> um, oh, yeah, these are awesome. The next one says, I had a heart attack a month ago, and it was a shock since I eat well, exercise, and my cholesterol was 225 with my HDL being 95. I am on a statin now. What will this do to help me? So that's an excellent question. HDL, 95 is very high, which is good, but once we start pushing over 100, it can have a detrimental effect. I'm not saying that's the case here. The question would be is, were there any of those other particle studies drawn? And for instance, would LP little a be severely elevated in your panel? That could be the reason why. Um, and it also depends, was this a heart attack from blockages and are, you know, were they really severe? Um, you know, it all it all depends, and it, it's all part of the panel. In your cholesterol panel, the general data sounds really good, but the question is, the particles, were there other particles that maybe have never been checked throughout your lifetime that could have been part of the problem? Great. Um, so this question is back to the SDLDLC. Um, it says, what do you do to lower that number to below 20%? Is there anything that you would um, advise your patients to? Yes, depending depending on each individual scenario. So sometimes diet and exercise is all would all be what the patient needs. However, the patients that I see, that's usually not the case. So long story short, statins can help mightily. 
we are seeing some good results with the injectable medications, the PCSK9 inhibitors, those help as well. Um, and there is a lot of research going on right now that are targeting the SDLDL particles. So in lipidology or in cholesterol management, there's so many great things that are being done. I wouldn't be surprised in the next couple of years that we have just a target for the small dense LDL particle. Right. So another personal question, um, are you taking Zetia in addition to the Crestor 40 milligrams a day? No, excellent question. No, I'm not actually. I, uh, I thought about that a few years ago and, you know, I had the, the mindset of, you know, I'm pretty young. I don't want to take a bunch of pills, which at the end of the day, none of us really want to do that. So when I went on Crestor or Resuvastatin, things changed significantly for me. And I didn't need, per se, a second agent to help me. Now, when I was taking Simvastatin or the old Zocor, it was horrible because it didn't help me. And I was at a very high dose and it barely budged. So when Crestor came out, for me personally, that's when my entire life changed. Right. Um, so. I Somebody asks, I've been taking a statin for many years. Is there a health risk? Good question. I was waiting for that one. Um, I, and I know we're going to talk a lot more about that when Dr. Underberg comes, comes in at the end of the series. Short answer to that is we're not quite sure. They are found to be very safe, and we are, you know, lipidology people and cardiologists are mostly very pro-statin because of all of the positive effects that it, you know, it, all the positivity that comes out and patient outcomes are, are better. However, there are those cases with the myalgias or we, the muscle cramping or the, the pains all over the body that can happen, not very often, but it does. And then there's also uh, cases of certain patients, albeit very, very low in the current data that shows it could increase your blood glucose so for certain patients that might be detrimental and then there's also the school of thought and this comes from several years ago that it could cause brain fog or forgetfulness i don't know that i've ever really seen that in practice now maybe one of the other um, panelists could touch on that especially dr underberg he's been doing this for a long time so he would be able to tell you a little bit more about what he's seen but to answer that question I think it's 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 safer to take it to prevent heart to help prevent heart attack and stroke and other problems than it is to not take one to worry about you know muscle cramping or um, brain fog or you know elevated sugars because there's other ways around it. We have new treatments now to get around the um, the so-called statin issues that are old as time now. <laughs> it's been a long time that these things have come up. So hopefully that answered your question. Right. So um, would it hurt to start checking kids at their checkups yearly? And if not, what age would you recommend doing that? So um, if there's a familial history for the parents, then you should check it at least once. I would say when the kids are younger, eight, nine, 10 years old, if everything's normal and they're young, healthy kid, and there's no problems with any you know genetic things with the parents you probably leave it alone until their late teens or early 20s or 20 year old like we said earlier in the presentation once every five years is the current recommendation if it's a healthy person and the values are normal now there are a lot of things that we've found drawing cholesterol profiles in children and sometimes on random you know, cholesterol blood panel draws for kids. We find things that they have, and then we trace it back to the parents actually having a, a pretty serious genetic problem as well. So I can't give an exact like, oh, you know, time frame for a young kid, but it, in my opinion, and in most of our opinions, it's always worth checking, you know, when they're a child at least once. Okay, great. So this is a good question. Um, it says, do you have any favorite risk score scale that you use and why that one over another one. I know in the last webinar, we had the ACC um, risk 
assessment score scale, but do you have one that you use in your office? Yes, I use the ACC risk stratification very much, um, and I would, I would say quite often. I also go with the, the data from all the studies with LDL lower than 70 for patients that are at high, high risk with you know, coronary disease and strokes and that kind of thing. I also use the Dutch Lipid Clinic scoring system when I'm dealing with a patient who has what I have, the heterozygous or homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. It, I've kind of started to shy away from using that, and I know this is kind of a little off topic, but in the past when we were trying to get patients more help with some of the newer drugs, insurance companies would not approve some of them without a Dutch lipid clinic score or some of the other scoring systems. So those are the three prim primarily what I look at, and anything from the National Lipid Association, I usually follow that to a T in every case. So I guess four different ways I look at it. Great, thank you. Um, so someone says, um, all my numbers are great. My HDL is 45. Is that good? The HDL is very good then? Yes. So if everything else looks good, your, your HDL is 45, you're a healthy individual, you, you exercise regularly, you eat well, you don't smoke, you're in good shape. 45 is totally fine. And that's anything above 40 we like to see. Great. All right, so what, another question here is, um, I was taking a statin for many years uh, before my heart stent, but I still got blockage. Um, can you explain maybe why that would be or in what case scenario that a statin was just not enough? There are several cases now where statins aren't enough. Some patients even though we treat their cholesterol and they're on the right medicine, can still build calcium deposits. Some of us build a ton, some of us build a little bit, some of us build in the middle. There are a lot of patients we see with calcifications that can block the coronaries. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what it was because you know you have to look at the whole picture. Statins aren't the 100% end all be all and they help tremendously, but there's no thing in the world that can be a perfect 100% prevention of a heart attack. Some of us are dealt with some genetics that we can't really help, and that could also have been the case. So I hope that answered the question. It's a little, um, it's, 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 it's a great question, but it can be difficult to answer that. Great. And just as a follow-up question to an earlier question that was posed about the cholesterol, um, too low cholesterol being bad for the brain. Um, could I, I guess that if you could elaborate a little bit on, is there any studies that show that it's not harmful to have a very low cholesterol or anything of that nature? That would be great. There are some studies and I will, I can get those for you guys and maybe we could have, I don't know how we could post them, but what we can, I don't know how we could do that, but we can, there are some, I don't know the names of the studies off the top of my head. I mean, there's, there's a few and, and we can look into that for sure. Okay. Um, and then and one more question and I will just put a last call out for questions. If anybody has a few questions or a question and they'd like to answer it, now's the time to place it in the chat. Um, we have just a couple more to go. This one is, how does alcohol or moderate drinking affect your cholesterol? So that goes back to a lot of times the triglyceride production because of how alcohol is metabolized in the liver. Um, we get an increase in glucose and an increase in triglyceride production. That's typically where it starts. And then sometimes as we metabolize and, and the triglycerides are going through our physiology and how we process things, they the other bad particles can increase by attachment of excess triglycerides it can happen so alcohol is not you know i mean i don't want to make a comment either way but we do know in excess it's definitely not good but uh it can increase triglycerides and your your blood sugar and your liver values all kinds of things great um, so this says, if a lady were to have breast cancer and because of the hormonal therapy, the LDL raises above um, the, uh, the okay range, is, 
diet truly enough or is that something that we should be looking at um, addressing with a statin or some other type of therapy? Great question. So how I look at this would be, you give the patient the opportunity to try diet and exercise as long as their lipid panel was normal and they didn't have any genetic issues prior to the cancer and hormonal therapy. If it can come down, a lot of times it doesn't, but if it could, then we keep a good eye on the patient. If not, then we will start treatment modalities and, and work with the patient um, to kind of put a plan together to what would work the best with minimal side effects and also bringing the patient's wishes into play as to are they against any particular treatments? Because I like to do um, the full circle and have the patients be highly involved in what we're doing. So that's how I would approach it. Great. Excellent. Well, I think we have come to the end of our questions. Um, they were some great questions, and I thank you all for um, submitting them, and hopefully you got the answers that you were looking for. Um, I just want to remind everybody before we depart today that the next session in our series, we're taking a couple of weeks break for the July 4th holiday, so it will be back We'll be back on July 16th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time for the fifth in our series. And this one will be focused on the important role of nutrition in heart health. Um, if you have any questions or additional questions that you think of after this event, you can email me at andrea.bear at mendedhearts.org. And I would be happy to try to find you the answer. So, Dr. Jabot, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate your time and effort in this. And to everyone out there, thank you for joining us today. And we hopefully we will see you in July. Have a great day. Thank you very much for having me. This was excellent, and I really appreciate it. Great. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.